Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, happy Friday afternoon, the first Friday of the new year. Um, hopefully, everyone is doing well. Thank you for those of you who are might be watching on Facebook. And for those of you who registered for the program, thank you again for taking the time to hopefully learn a little something from me in this series that we call Ask the Dietitian. We run it once a month. And we choose a topic that hopefully pertains to oncology nutrition, and that's my specialty as a dietitian. And then we allow our participants to submit questions related to that topic. And I use this time to present a PowerPoint, which will answer those questions. So everyone who has registered for the program receives a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, along with a handful of recipes that I think are helpful to kind of um, really expand the knowledge that they learned today and integrate into their cancer protective diet. So without further ado, we're going to get started and I'm going to share my screen and share with you our my PowerPoint that I put together. Our topic for the month of January, we thought would be a helpful one. It's all about nutrition and food as it relates to our mood and maybe even our cognitive health as well. And maybe that's important for anyone this time of year, um, because, you know, it's a new year, but sometimes January becomes a little gray, a little difficult to kind of lift our spirits, a lot more challenging than some of the warmer months. So what can we do to help ourselves if we're finding that we'd like to modulate our mood in any way possible? We're going to explore that today. So on the agenda, I'd like to first really try to answer this question does what we eat, in fact, influence our mood at all? And then I'm going to list the questions that participants had submitted. Some of them are not related to the topic, so I listed them. Um, some of the questions that are not related to the topic, I have some time to answer today that I, I thought would be helpful for really anyone in the audience. Um, and so we'll see how I do with those uh, questions. Um, and then I'm going to answer them to the best of my ability with the most current information that I'm aware of, and then provide some additional resources if you're looking to kind of expand your knowledge, as well as those recipes uh, that you might be interested in. Okay, so food and mood. First, I, I do want to mention that emotions are really essential, right? We need emotions. They're a part of our life, and they're not always a bad thing, right? Right. Some describe emotions as being experienced in the mind and the body. And gosh, does that ever resonate with me? But also my work and practice here at Cancer Wellness Center, we really do try to tap into the mind and the body. And simultaneously, is there anything that we can um, acknowledge free from judgment in order to help experience that, what we're feeling, both mind and body, so that we can do something about it? And that can be very empowering, especially for someone who's been diagnosed with a cancer. There is no agreement as to what is a good or a bad emotion, right? I think everyone can understand that. So I think this is all really personalized and um, whatever your takeaway from that is, I want you to recognize that there is no such thing as really a good or bad emotion. I do want to disclose that if you are concerned about your mood, and you have some rising concerns about that, please seek some help and attention from your care team. Um, as much as I believe in the, that food is medicine and how powerful food can be in our lives, it's not a replacement necessarily for a necessary medical intervention. A little bit more on food and mood. Okay, so there is some accumulating research that suggests that if we're eating a poor quality diet, it may exacerbate some of our known mood disorders, such as anxiety and depression. Good to know, right? So how might that be possible? Well, we do know that the composition, structure, and function of our brain are dependent upon the availability of nutrients, including lipids, amino acids, and some of our vitamins and minerals. So that means we have to eat those things, right? And we're still exploring what that really means but in theory, it makes sense that what we're eating does influence the way that our mood um, is affected and really how we're feeling. We also know that neurotransmitters and hormones that are made inside of our gut and the microbes that live there are also influenced by what we eat. So that could be a very powerful opportunity for us to make some impact. 
And so what we're working on understanding, and this is a pretty young field of nutritional psychiatry, the thought is that if we improve nutrition, it could promote emotional and mental well-being. Now, there is something called the gut-brain axis, and I just touched on that in the last slide, and maybe you've heard about this, but apparently our digestive system happens to guide our emotions. Did you know that? And it does this through microorganisms that live there and they're non-human cells, these microorganisms. And they just are really just hanging out inside our digestive system. And, but they're very powerful in the way that they interact with us. They activate pathways that happen to travel between where they're living in the gut and also our brain. And neurons in our digestive tract make dopamine and serotonin. I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment. A diet that supports the growth of beneficial microbes may positively affect the production of those chemicals. So that could be a real um, key connection there. Now, I do want to mention this, um, this uh, mechanism that we call reverse causality. And it's like a fancy scientific research study term. And really what this reverse causality means is that what we think is the relationship between two variables may actually be the opposite. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to explain that well, as well as I can. And this is a little bit of a complicated diagram, um, but let's see if I can get my fancy little laser pen here. All right, so in terms of our physical health, right? There's no denying that we can influence our physical health through our lifestyle and a high quality diet that I'm going to talk about today is definitely a part of that through multiple biological pathways, right? So we can influence our physical health. This is a known fact. This is why I exist, right? Why I have job security. What we're working on understanding is more about our emotional and mental health, right? So if we're looking at cognition as well as mood disorders, does our diet and what we eat influence that? We're, we're learning, we're not really sure. And it actually could be the opposite relationship that our mental health or our mood influences what we eat, which probably makes sense to most of you, right? I think that certainly if we're not in a great mood, we could feel like eating different things. We could crave different foods, right? So it's important to recognize that and work with that. So I think as I'm going through answering some of these questions and presenting this information, we do want to keep this in mind. We don't really know if it's the chicken or the egg, right? Could our mood influence our food choices and not the other way around? We, we just don't know just yet. So here's what we do know, however, that eating a balanced diet can increase our body's ability availability of serotonin. And if you're aware of what serotonin is, it's the feel-good chemical that's essential for mood regulation. And as it turns out, the protein that we eat in a lot of different foods, it has been shown to support higher levels of both dopamine and norepinephrine. So especially uh, protein in animal foods, such as fish, chicken, turkey, but also some plant sources like tofu and beans. We also know some from a pretty well-established clinical trial that fruit and vegetables also provide micronutrients and have been shown to be associated with improved mental well-being. The name of that clinical trial was SMILES, <laughs> as it turns out. And they found that individuals who were eating more fruits and vegetables reported higher uh, levels on scales of their mood. I, will want, I do want to share that the research has really focused only on symptoms, right? So reporting how you feel, not the actual mood disorders. So I think that's important to point out. And research is evolving, and we currently need a little bit more information in order to make evidence-based recommendations. So for lack of the evidence-based recommendations, a lot of times what we, we focus on instead are experience-based recommendations or what we call expert consensus. So to make a decision to choose certain foods to enjoy as part of an overall healthy diet, as long as it's not gonna harm you, it's probably gonna benefit you on some level and maybe perhaps enhance your mood and your cognitive health. All right, so now we're gonna move on to our questions. 
So these are the first set and the first two are very similar. So I kind of lumped them together. The first two are what are food, the best foods for anxiety and depression. How does nutrition affect our mood and what food is best for a good mood? The second is, does a warm drink made with milk really calm us? Or is it just the fact that it is a warm drink in general? I think that's an interesting question. The third, how to mitigate emotional stress when you're trying to eat healthy. That happens to be my favorite question of all that we're asked. I think that's a great one to recognize. Uh, next set of questions, is it okay to drink one or two cups of coffee per day? I know I've tried to give it up before, but it hasn't been easy. Protein and fiber in a vegan diet. Best food before bed. How much time should I eat that food before I'm planning to go to bed? And lastly, are there any foods to increase or decrease as I start radiation? And then the last question, a balanced diet for chronic kidney failure, congestive heart failure, and prostate cancer. I will say for this very last question, I don't have the time to answer it today. And I also don't think it's fair for me to try to answer it today because this type of question requires a personalized assessment and as well as a plan that can only be provided by a registered dietitian. So if you're in the audience and you submitted this question, make some time to either work with me or with a registered dietitian so you can really dedicate a more specific plan that's recommended for you. All right, so let's get to these questions. Uh, the first set, remember, was really asking about mood and what foods and what part of nutrition is really best for a good mood and, and really how to cope with anxiety and depression through nutrition. So I'm going to start first with depression, and this is what uh, the research has suggested uh, so far, that a high-quality diet is associated with a decreased risk for depression. And maybe you're wondering, okay, so Lori, what is a high-quality diet, right? That could probably be an Ask the Dietitian segment altogether. A high-quality diet means that you're eating a lot of fruit and vegetables, a lot of whole grains, you're eating some fish, you're using olive oil, you're having a little bit of low-fat dairy. And there's a ton of antioxidants found in those foods. Most of those foods are hopefully minimally processed, if at all possible. That's a high quality diet. So when the research looks at individuals who eat that way, that's how they would characterize their meals and their snacks most of the time. They may not eat that way every single day, but for most of the time, that's a high quality diet. So some people eat the opposite of that, right? So they're hardly eating some of those foods or they're eating highly processed versions of them. As it turns out, also this high quality diet, as I just shared, it's eating less of processed and red meats, less of the refined grains and sweets, as well as high fat dairy and saturated fat. So that's how we would characterize a high quality diet. So I want to share with you a very popular way of eating that you probably have heard about, and maybe it's another as a dietitian topic. It is the Mediterranean diet, and this is a great example of a high quality diet. Now the Mediterranean diet is not a diet per se. I would call it a style or a way of eating, right? And you can describe a Mediterranean diet. If you look at the meals, or if you ever looked at a cookbook with recipes, most of those meals have a variety or a version of the foods that are listed there. There's vegetables, there's fruit, there's whole grains, and there's some interesting whole grains too, right? Like farro or millet, beans and lentils are abundant in the Mediterranean diet. They also consume seeds. They use a lot of olive oil and they use a lot of culinary herbs and spices. They're eating fish at least twice a week. They sometimes eat more small amounts of cheese and yogurt, but it's not absent from their diet. And they're also eating small amounts of eggs and poultry. Again, it's not absent, it's, it's present. So this is also a version of the plant-based diet if you haven't heard of that as well. So the, here are some images of what we would describe as Mediterranean meals, right? And so maybe you're familiar with a lot, you know, I see salads, I see like a yogurt parfait, I see a bean salad, I see some salmon, some whole green dishes, some fruit. And yes, I even see pasta on that um, image. So we're not afraid to eat carbohydrates, right? This could be definitely helpful towards an overall cancer protective diet, but as it turns out, it may enhance our mood. A lot of people ask me for more specific suggestions if we're going to pursue a Mediterranean diet. So I love the idea of swaps or substitutes. So if you like to snack on things like crackers or chips or even pretzels with a dip, let's swap that out with some veggies, maybe all or just even some, 
right? With some veggies and maybe even a higher protein plant-based version of a dip like hummus. Set of white rice, something like quinoa. Sandwiches made with white bread. Maybe we can do some roasted vegetables in like a sourdough bread or even a whole wheat tortilla. Swapping out hamburgers with salmon croquettes. Full fat ice cream for maybe that fruit and yogurt parfait that I shared. And eggs with hollandaise. I don't know too many people that eat that, but eggs with salsa would add some vegetables, right? Great way to pursue a Mediterranean diet. Now, what about anxiety? Because I was included as part of that question as well, right? So with anxiety, the research suggests also that a high quality diet is associated with, sorry, I didn't put anxiety here, decreased risk for anxiety as well as depression. So the research, I think, is more supportive of, of eating that way to reduce risk for depression or elevate mood. But the research is accumulating for anxiety as well. And, and from what I saw in the research, they looked at specific food and nutrients as part of this high quality diet. They found specifically vegetables and fruit, omega-3 fats, nuts and seeds, as well as culinary herbs. Those seem to stand out as it related to managing anxiety. And what that might look like in terms of these foods, especially that second one on the list, those omega-3 fats, in my mind, that automatically makes me think of an anti-inflammatory diet. So by the way, the Mediterranean diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. So it looks like that's pretty helpful on a lot of levels. So let's talk about those omega-3 fats because I mentioned that. So I, I learned this in preparation for today's program. In 1981, it seems like forever ago, right? Um, a deficiency of omega-3 fats in the diet was thought to contribute to psychiatric disorders. I was like, wow, interesting. They were reported to be, these individuals in these um, studies, they were reported to be successfully treated with flaxseed oil, which is especially high in omega-3 fats. Very interesting, right? Now that research sort of like went by the wayside. We kind of forgot about it, right? But maybe there's some emergence of interest in this particular topic. So we will find out more soon. Now, most of us are not eating omega-3 fats. We, we tend to find that Americans have deficiencies in omega-3 fats. We just tend to not eat foods that contain omega-3 fats. And they're vital. We, they are essential. We do need to eat them. And they're involved in the formation of cell membranes, cell transport, energy storage, and they act as single signaling molecules in the brain. So no wonder why they might be related to um, our mood. Research remains inconclusive, but eating more omega-3 fats would not be harmful and would be beneficial for our overall health. I talk about omega-3 fats all the time with the individuals I work with. So where can we find them in some of the foods we're eating? We certainly know they're very high in our fatty fish, such as salmon, herring, anchovies, and sardines. But as I mentioned earlier, that flaxseed oil and on the slide here in the study, um, that's also a, a, a great source of omega-3 fats. Ground flax seeds are another source, as well as walnuts and chia seeds. Next question, does a warm drink made with milk really calm us or is it just the fact that it's a warm drink in general? Great question. So yeah, so we think that there are some um, components of milk that seem to calm us and are related to sleep. So there's some sleep promoting effects and calming effects of milk. Um, it could be a psychological association. So did you know this, that a woman um, who is breastfeeding her breast milk that she produces in the evening is higher in tryptophan and melatonin. And that thought is that as she's feeding her baby or babies, um, it's gonna help them sleep through the night. I think that's fascinating, right? There's a reason for that. Um, but also too, if we grew up in a home where our mom or our caregiver gave us milk before bed, that creates that association of, oh, it's time to calm down and wind down and get ready for sleep. But there's more than that. There might be an explanation, nutritionally speaking. So milk happens to be high in tryptophan and tryptophan is converted into serotonin and melatonin. And those are the hormones that tell us to kind of calm down and uh, wind down for sleep. FYI, tryptophan is an amino acid and it's considered essential, meaning that we need to eat and drink it in the diet. Our body can make some amino acids, but not tryptophan. 
So drinking milk before bed, whether it's warm or cold, because the research hasn't tested either theory, so I can't answer that question, but whether it's warm or cold in theory has the potential to promote sleep and to calm us. If you're curious, I would totally do this for myself. See if you can do a little experiment. And if you enjoy milk as part of your overall cancer protective diet, if you have a warm glass of milk in the evening or a cold one, how would that help calm you down or not? You can make those observations for yourself and that's personalized nutrition, very helpful. Now I do wanna mention about tryptophan, remember that's the amino acid that makes melatonin and serotonin helps calm us down. Animal foods really are the best sources of tryptophan. So if we're looking for, if we're not drinking milk and we're looking at some of the alternatives to dairy, then we may not have the same effect. There has, there haven't been any research studies to elaborate on this more, but those non-dairy versions um, are not going to contain as much tryptophan, if at all any. So we might miss out on that calming effect. Okay. Just wanted to point that out. Okay. Next question. How to mitigate emotional stress eating when trying to eat healthy? I love this question. And I feel like I work with this very concept very often with my individuals here at the center and in the group that I help run that is starting in just a couple of weeks. We talk about this a lot. So eating can be stressful, right? And, but I would say I, I always want anyone I'm working with to return to what food is. What, what does it give you in your life? And I I want to argue that it could be a basic enjoyment of life, right? And if it becomes a burden, we lose the pleasure and benefit from just simply enjoying food, right? And that would be a shame. If eating, if eating healthy creates stress, does it potentially negate any potential health benefits from trying to eat healthy? I would argue probably, right? And so in this circumstance, we would, I would recommend to reassess how healthy you feel you should eat. And I italicize should, because I feel like sometimes that's the pressure and stress that individuals feel that they're supposed to eat a certain way, right? When, if you work with a dietitian, hopefully you can learn how small changes can be significant, right? And a small change to your diet can create significant positive changes, not only to your nutritional health, but also your emotional well-being, right? Because you feel confident that you can make a change and that you're noticing an impact in terms of your health. And as a dietitian, I can help you understand that a little bit better. There's no such thing as perfection when we're eating. Thank goodness, right? So there's some opportunities when we're eating. And I think I, I, it's always important to remember that healthy eating habits vary for each person. There is no one size fits all approach. Very often strict rules and restrictions can cause stress, right? Which has been shown to set us up for failure because these restrictions may create a cycle and it may result in us eating less than desired food choices in terms of our own decisions. I would argue that a healthy relationship or at least a neutral relationship with food is important for both our mental and physical well-being. And listening to our bodies and eating what serves our bodies as well as our minds is one way to cultivate that relationship, right? So that mindfulness and paying attention to what our body and our mind is telling us we should do for ourselves, right? Nothing externally, it's all internal. And that's intuitive eating. And that's also a very powerful approach in terms of cancer survivorship. Next question, I happen to like this one a lot too. Is it okay to drink one to two cups of coffee per day? I know I've tried to give it up, but but it hasn't been easy. I get it. I'm a coffee drinker myself and it's, it's not an easy habit to break. Well, did you know that there are 1000 natural bioactive compounds and nutrients in coffee? So guess what? It's cancer protective. And I love sharing that information because that's, that's a little known fact. Um, it has been shown specifically to reduce the risk for both endometrial as well as liver cancer, right? And it may impact other cancer types. We just don't have enough information to share about that just yet, but it has cancer protective properties because of the following cancer fighters. And it has melatonins, cholergenic acids, lignans, caffeine, and diterpenes. I don't have the time to get into all the ways that those specific cancer fighters help protect us. So you gotta take my word for it. They are cancer fighters. 
In general, the upper limit of caffeine, according to the experts, is up to 400 milligrams per day. And just for your information, one cup of coffee is about 80 milligrams. That's very different than some of the servings and types of coffee or coffee drinks we might be getting at cafes. So that number may be altered a little bit. But it looks like we can enjoy one to two or maybe even three cups of coffee every single day. And I would say I wouldn't encourage this person to give up coffee unless you feel like you're caffeine sensitive. I'm not really sure, you know, the reason to feel to give it up. And you may want to skew your caffeine intake earlier if you're caffeine sensitive and it's throwing off your ability to fall asleep at night. I would prefer that we don't add a lot of sugar, a lot of cream or whipped cream to our coffee every day, every time, right? Maybe we're going to minimize that a little bit because that changes the effects in terms of cancer fighting properties. Next question, what about protein and fiber in a vegan diet? So first let's define a vegan diet. So it means no animal products at all, right? So not even honey. It is possible to eat enough protein on a vegan diet. Did you know that? And planning is helpful with the advice, of course, of a dietitian in, in order to ensure adequate consumption of essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin B12. So on a vegan diet, we do make sure someone's eating sources or taking supplemental sources of vitamin B12 because that can be hard to consume on a vegan diet. It is automatically higher in fiber. And I can't wait to share that news in just a moment, especially if, if on a vegan diet, you're consuming mostly unprocessed whole foods. Some people I have worked with in the past consume a vegan diet, but they sort of get stuck in a rut and they eat, end up eating a lot of highly processed like safe foods because it's all they know to do. Right. So we want to really think about uh, variety, but also the amount of processing, regardless of the, the style of eating we are choosing. Now, first, let's talk about protein. It is very possible to eat plenty of protein on a vegan diet. So we're going to focus on beans and lentils. There's about 15 grams for every cup serving seeds and nuts, especially seeds. They're high in protein, whole grains such as oats and buckwheat. And these are like average numbers, of course. I like to talk about tofu and tempeh and how versatile they are and how to really explore different ways of using them in the kitchen. They are bang for buck in terms of protein, but as well as fiber and other cancer fighters, as well as pea protein beverages. There's, you know, I was talking about, about milk alternatives earlier. There's so many on the market, right? So we just want to choose one that maybe suits the need of that individual. And if protein is needed, pea protein beverages are a good choice. I talk a lot about um, our requirements for amino acids, not protein per se, right? So I mentioned this about tryptophan. That's an essential amino acid. And there's nine amino acids that are essential, meaning we need to eat them. Our body cannot make them. There are 11 others that are not essential. And as it turns out, our body can make them. Fascinating, right? So in order to make sure, if you are a vegan, in order to make sure you're eating all of those essential amino acids, Experts do recommend that they consume at least two or more servings of beans and lentils daily, because then that means you're getting enough of the essential amino acids. Now let's talk about fiber, my favorite topic. So we want to consume foods that have little to no processing, again, regardless of the way that we're eating, if we're vegan or not. So here's some examples, and you know these things, right? Apples have more fiber. They're less processed than apple juice. Corn has more fiber and less processed than something like a corn chip or corn tortillas. Oats, more fiber, less processed than something like a cereal bar made with oats. And those are just some examples. The goal from the experts is for us to eat about 25 to 30 grams of fiber every single day. Did you know, if you were to guess, how much fiber on average, according to surveys, do vegans eat? It's going to be a lot, right? Because they're eating a lot of these whole plant foods. I was shocked to learn this. They're eat, they eat over 40 grams on average, according to surveys of fiber per day. So that's amazing, right? That's a good amount of fiber. Sometimes that's a little too much for someone who isn't accustomed to eating a lot of fiber. So that would be a big leap. So if you're looking at adding more fiber into your diet, we always encourage lots of fluids, especially water. That helps our gut digest all that extra fiber. About bedtime. So best food before bed and what time should we eat before bed? Great question. So according to our nighttime routine, I would say 
you know, really in general, actually, no matter what time of day we're eating, I would recommend that we honor our body's hunger cues. And some of us, if we're really paying attention, we notice when our hunger is starting to wake up and we can have something to eat that suits that need. And we can eat whenever our body asks for food, not according to some external clock, but really our own internal cues. So, but to avoid disrupting sleep, experts advise that we eat no less than, sorry, two hours, not greater than, less than two hours. So we want to eat more, two hours or more before we're going to go to bed because that two hour window is when it may disrupt our sleep. Now, depending on our hunger level, depending on what time it is, right? The amount of food will vary what we're going to have at that time, right? The amount that might matter. We might have, we might have a little need for a little nosh or we might be really hungry, right? So the amount is going to vary, but the type of food I want you to have before bed I want it to be consistent no matter how much you're eating. So we're going to look towards nutrient-dense options in amounts according to what our hunger tells us. So the research suggests that nutrient-dense options, if it's a snack or like a small meal, if it contains carbohydrates, especially high-quality carbohydrates and protein, this is going to help our metabolism the next day. And it's also going to promote quality sleep. So here are some options. Banana. A banana before bed, why not? With maybe some almond or peanut butter, oats with some chopped pistachios, some citrus, which is in season, um, with some pumpkin seeds, yogurt with berries and sunflower seeds. All of those options have sleep promoting properties based on the nutrients they contain. So most of them have magnesium and magnesium is an important uh, mineral that's essential for helping us regulate our sleep and helping to wind down for the day. Some of those foods, including pistachios, have melatonin in them, right? So melatonin is the hormone we make as the sun goes down to help us prepare for sleep. Um, and then we also see that um, something like yogurt um, is high in protein as well, but it also has GABA. If you're not familiar with what GABA is, it's a key neurotransmitter that helps calm our bodies down and prepare for sleep. So maybe those are some good options for bedtime. And then our last question. So what about foods to increase or decrease as I start radiation? I think that is a great question, but this is where meeting with a dietitian is very helpful because it depends, it depends, it depends. Where are you getting radiation, right? What part of your body, wherever you're getting your radiation will impact how you feel and potentially your ability to eat your normal healthful diet. Fluid needs are generally slightly higher for anyone on after treatment, including radiation. And I wanted to include this chart because I thought it might be helpful for any participants who submitted this question. So it just shows you a nice little table of the radiation therapy location. So where it is on the body, is it at the head and neck? Is it in the abdomen? Is it the upper torso, lower torso, in the pelvis? If that, depending on where the radiation is going to be located, will impact any potential side effects, right? And that's where a dietitian can be helpful as well to plan for those side effects and then to help cope and manage with those side effects if they're present. Okay, so for example, if someone is getting pelvic radiation, they may experience diarrhea and they may then have some risk for dehydration. They may not absorb some of their nutrients properly. So working with a dietitian is important in that circumstance. Now, what I will share is that um, depending on the location and intensity of the treatment, some side effects may temporarily impact ability to eat as desired. Sometimes individuals I work with hardly have any side effects at all. And the good news is that it's temporary if they are present. So adjusting the diet will help to minimize the impact of those side effects and promote optimal nutrition status. That's what we're looking to do. Um, and I would say for the person that submitted this question to discuss this with your radiation oncology team, if any adjustments need to be made and do it early because then you can plan for it, right? I would recommend someone eat as normal as possible, but if symptoms start to present themselves, then you would make some adjustments to your diet. And a dietitian can give you more specific guidance. And that's why we're helpful. So I just want to share some resources and then additional recipes. So there's a dietitian. She calls herself the food and mood dietitian. And she has a great website full with um, content. So there's a blog. There's some recipes. Um, she even has 
um, some really helpful articles, you know, like flaxseed oil. You can learn all about ground flaxseed and flaxseed oil on her website. Um, and then there's um, an institute in Australia, actually, um, and it's the Food and Mood Center, but it's part of Deakin University, and it's a multidisciplinary um, center. So they have experts in all different fields um, that really help to uh, establish what is this relationship between food and mood. And so their website's great, but they, they have um, on there and you can click on this link directly. Um, it's a, really a great little guide on how to eat a certain way in order to potentially positively impact mood. So I thought that would be very helpful. I explained it in my answer. It's sort of this high quality, anti-inflammatory, maybe a Mediterranean-esque type of diet, but that website will give you more specific um, and black and white information for you to look at. I also wanted to share some recipes that I included separately. So the flaxseed oil, um, if you've never used it, it's best used really at the table because the oil itself goes rancid quite quickly. So we don't recommend cooking with it. So it's great in a salad dressing. So I've included a salad dressing for you to consider trying. Um, I love the idea of, I think avocado toast is still pretty popular. I love the idea of throwing in some extra vegetables in there, right? Why not some arugula and some chopped up tomatoes? That goes really well with avocado, as it turns out. And then sprinkling some walnuts on there for, for some omega-3s. And then um, I think overnight oats are still quite trendy as well. A very helpful way to start your day or use as a snack before bedtime, because maybe you're going to include those oats and some pistachios and maybe even some dairy. Now, our next Ask the Dietitian is scheduled for February 2nd. It's usually the first Friday of the month, and we're going to run it from 1 to 145, and our topic will be the gut and the gut microbiome. If you're fascinated by it as much as I am, it should be a great Ask the Dietitian segment. So I'm going to stop my share there. I thank you all for watching. And if we have more time for questions, we have time. So I'm happy to address anything. <laughs>